don't get moving. You're not even ready. I've already said that. Sorry. There was a, a southern northern divide in everything, and comedy was one of them. We're doing up his push bike. It's going to be bespoke. <laughs> bespoke. If we're talking about television, they didn't like to put on northern accents because they were coarse and uncouth. <laughs> But with the dawning of a new decade, change was in the air. During the 60s, it seems to be that suddenly you were allowed to be working class and it's like the whole of the culture suddenly discovered all the other bits of the country that had never been represented. Television was a, a grab back by urban working class, northern actors, writers. It democratised popular culture again. I think in television terms, the fact that the North became fashionable is largely down to one programme, which is Coronation Street. It said something about working class life, it said something about Northern working class life, and it also said something about the change, and change that was going on in the 60s. The show coming on. Ah, well, it's not the valve for sure. I told you that. And you know, a bike in the front room. And I looked over to me dad, and he was doing the same. Well, that lad should learn to live in his own class. And we thought, this is real life. That doesn't come out of his grant, and you can't tell me it does. No, I'll tell you straight, it doesn't. I bought it for him, and he never asked me. <laughs> we certainly raised a woman. <laughs> Anything doing down the Labour Exchange? Manager called me into his office. You got a job? No, he wanted to congratulate me. I've been going there so often now, I can go with him on the staff outings to Blackpool. <laughs> the thing is, historically, the best comedy had always come out of the north of England anyway. What a dump. They just seem to see the funny side of life. That kind of musical and variety comedy was something that was a, a product of the Industrial Revolution, of all these people who'd originally come from the countryside being crammed together in these new industrial towns, entertaining each other in the face of enormous hardship. <laughs> Where's the television set gone? <laughs> the man came from the rental firm and took it back. Well, you need a sense of humour to help you get through these things. I mean, how many stand-up comics do you know from Henley on Thames? Not many. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Something's gone wrong. You put the wrong caps. It's not Birkenhead, it's Monte Carlo. Oh. <laughs> I thought that was a double act on the phone number. No. <laughs> huh? Put Monte Carlo. Sorry. Is that better? That's better. That's it. I think the fact that they're northern is absolutely key to their success and their charm and their comedy. They all say that. It made them much more relatable and much more down to earth. Okay, Norman, can we go into the number? Give me the four bar. Northern and Southern Comics, well, I think it would have been hard to do the style of what they did without them being from the North, because I think there is a very Northern influence in what they do and, and, the, and the, the playfulness in what they do. I suppose traditionally Northern humour's friendly, I suppose, for want of a better word. Trying to be shocking on stage with a Lancashire accent, you just sound like Wallace and Gromit with Tourette's. People like Morgan and Wise broke the mould. Now, wait a minute, no, 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 no. And opened avenues for even people like myself uh, to appear on television. By the time Morecambe and Wise came back on TV, they had two factors working in their favour. One, by the early 60s, it was OK to be Northern. We had the Beatles, we had Tar Beat, we had Doddy. And the other thing was, they had all those years and years of live experience behind them, so they knew exactly how their act worked. And this time they realised what they needed to do to translate it to TV. Right, Older, wiser and, well, really just better. From now on, it would be done their way. Hello, VT. TC1 here. Combining their heritage and unique style, they put their version of variety on the box. 
I think the Morecambe and Wise TV shows from a very early time, particularly the BBC years, uh, there were a deliberate comment about the variety that they come out of and then used almost ironically, almost taking the mickey out of themselves and that era. I don't like this place. We it's play... horrible. It is, isn't it? Yes. We played a place like this not so long ago, didn't we? Mm. <laughs> the Egyptian Empire. No, it was a Liverpool Empire to be exact. <laughs> so much of the comedy was vaudevillesque, all, all the catchphrases. What do you think of it so far? Ruggish! <laughs> the irreverence, which was such a feature of, of early music hall. I mean, who else but Eric could say to somebody like Yehudi Menuhin, bring your banjo? Who else would do that? I'd refer to Glenda Jackson as Sonny. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd now like to take a trip down memory lane. Let's have it. Come on, let's have it. Hey, you're the best. Don't talk. Come on, let's have it. I'm going to hold on to it. They still kept the tabs in the show, what we call tabs in the theatre, the, 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 the curtains. They still love to work those curtains, which it obviously comes, you don't see curtains in a television studio. Primrose will be thrilled when I handle this. Primrose? Yes? Is that the name? Yes. I'd like to see it. Oh. Hey, what do you think? Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> They're not daft. They know if you do the beginning in front of curtains, there's constantly a sense of anticipation that what's going to be there when the curtains draw back. On the curtains and let's have a look at Primrose. I can't. You know. And I'll tell you why you can't. Because there isn't a Primrose, is there? Of course there isn't, you fool! <laughs> I only come out to get the show away with a dull thud. <laughs> You live in a little dream world of your own. I don't know why I work with you. I really it's a very know. clever thing that they kind of deconstructed the show. There's a curtain and it's front cloth and it's like it's a theatrical experience, but it's cameras. And they're brilliant at the, using the cameras and talking to the audience through that lens. I assure you, gentlemen, <laughs> that until I get my money, wherever you go, I shall go. I could prove awkward around about 11 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Wow. Going out with Ada Bailey, she's a raver, That's you know that. A lot of the stuff they took from the, the live shows, uh, one of the main things they took was the asides. <laughs> Let's get rid of it. <clears throat> the idea that the act's going a bit wrong, of grabbing to one side of the stage and say, you're not doing it right, son. Right? And they brought that into television. <laughs> doing it, sort of typical. <sighs> nothing's happened, nothing's happened. I saw this in the 39 steps. Yeah. <laughs> that was their genius. They didn't go, how can we make our act televisual? They just said, no, we're going to put our act on television. I often think of Eric and Ernie's TV shows as a kind of Noah's Ark. In a way, what they'd done is they'd rescued all these little elements from variety. <laughs> that there's a real sincere, nostalgic homage to, uh, to these lost variety years where, they, where they'd learnt their trade. <laughs> But it wasn't just this new understanding of how their act could work on television. Running Wild had highlighted the significance of trying to find the perfect writer. Just a moment, fellas. <laughs> What's going on when you're going in the tent there with the girl? It's in the script. It's it's sit, sit and dig with girls in the tent. Must have been in very small print. I didn't see it. Writer's perks. We don't get anything else. Yeah. Listen, wait a minute. In all of this, we mustn't forget their writers were uh, totally crucial. It was rotten! <laughs> and I thought it was very good. I think you have a lovely voice. Thank you, you Arabian crawler, you! <laughs> Dick Hills and Sid Green, and famously Eddie Braben, were sort of 50% of the success of it, really. The way that Eddie Braben came to write Eric and Ernie's TV shows came out of a near tragedy, which was Eric's first heart attack. He was told to take three months off. He decided to take six. In the meantime, quite understandably, Sid and Dick went off to work elsewhere, and so they were no longer available. It was Bill Cotton's inspired idea. He'd heard that Eddie Braben, who had been writing for Ken Dog, had had an argument or something. And the rest, as they say, is the stuff of television legend. I firmly believe that you've got to know how to write gags, as I did. I did nothing else for ten years, and then evolved to writing sketches. And when I more or less got the knack of writing sketches, all that training over the ten years of writing gags came in totally handy. <laughs>